Hands up if you want to see an incredible triple queen sacrifice. I'm Grandmaster Max Lingworth, and there was this unbelievable brilliancy that was played in the FIDE World Cup 2021, a tournament that's used to determine who qualifies for the World Championship semi-finals known as the Candidates. This was a game played between the Danish Grandmaster Mads Andersen against Chilean Grandmaster Pablo Sarinas Herrera. Before I get into that game though, I want to show you a game by Bobby Fischer, where Fischer defeated Robert Byrne in just 21 moves in New York 963. I'm going to cover that game a bit more quickly, so that we have a lot of time for the main game I want to show you. But this one is also an absolute brilliancy and absolutely worth it. Now, if you want to see more brilliancies, do make sure to hit that like button if you're enjoying the video, and also consider subscribing for more of my Grandmaster Chess videos. So, Byrne decides to play very safely, to play the exchange rather than the lines where you keep the, the tension, uh, as it were. Uh, so we have knight c3, bishop to g7, and now instead of playing a move like knight f3 and maybe thinking about putting a knight on e5, the bishop on f4, instead white plays the move of pawn to e3, which is a much more passive setup and definitely not so critical, because even though you're keeping that long diagonal open for the bishop, on the other hand, that knight doesn't give as much grip over the center, and we're going to see Fischer exploit that very well with his next moves. So castles, b6 is a good move because the bishop isn't really doing that much on a square like f5 or g4, but if you put on a6 it would be more active than the fiancaret bishop on g2. One principle I've found is that fiancaret bishops tend to be a little bit less effective in symmetrical pawn structures because you can see that both of these fiancaret bishops are kind of biting on granite at the moment. The game continued b3. Uh, so White's trying to do the same idea with bishop a3. I'm not so sure about it necessarily, maybe bishop d2, but I can understand why he wants to get the bishop more active. And I don't think it's an outright mistake, even if I do think, after Fischer's move of rookie 8 that it feels like practically it's a little bit easier to play black somehow, mainly because I think that, well, his knight is better than white's knight, but otherwise the position is pretty close to balanced. But here is where the game, I think, starts to turn a little bit against white, where white plays this move of queen d2 that, again, it's not an immediate mistake, but I think that after seeing what happens in the game, you'll see why I think it's better to play rook e1, rook c1, and maybe knight f4, trying to put some pressure on d5 to avoid what transpired in the game. The game went queen d2, and yeah, what would be your plan as black if you're in this position? It's black to move, and also a good opportunity for me to take a little water break while you pause the video and think about it, if you're so inclined. Okay, did you manage to play like Fisher? Well, if you went for the continuation of e5, then you did, so good job. Uh, white decided to take, and yeah, on the one hand, after knight e5, we see that this pawn on d5 is under attack by a lot of pieces. On the other hand, we also see that black's pieces have got a lot more active, and white's not actually threatening to take that pawn yet, because if knight takes d5, black can play knight takes, and if white were to take with the queen, he's leaving that knight on e2 undefended. If you play bishop f d5, it's even worse. Even though bishop e2 is still winning, you can actually win the queen here with the move knight f3. Remember, when you see a good move, look for a better one. The point is, after they take, to avoid the queen and knight fork, we take their queen for free, just like that. So, now the question for white is, well, white should put a rook on d1 to maximize the pressure against the d5 pawn, but which rook should he put on d1 at this stage? And I'm a little bit surprised that Byrne got this one wrong in one sense, but on the other hand, his move strategically does have a certain logic. It just kind of fails tactically, as we'll see. So, if you were going to play the move rook ad1, congratulations, that is the right move, where it does help you to get out the range of the bishop and, and make sure this pawn is well defended. I do think the black still has very good compensation. For example, after queen e7, it's probably still a bit too risky to take on d5. Because even though you're winning a pawn, like you don't have knight f3 anymore because takes and we see that the queen is now defended by the rook. But after rook a d8, still knight f3 is a threat. Also, this pin is very nettlesome for white. Moves like queen b5 can also potentially hit the knight as well as the rook. So it's really quite a difficult position for white here. So I guess realizing that, well, if you can't take on d5, well, probably you should do something else. Actually, the computer has a very radical idea of playing knight f4 and basically sacrificing the exchange to kind of get rid of the bishop and get that d5 pawn in return. 
I don't think the bishop pair would give and pawn would give like full compensation, but I guess it's enough that you're not more than a little bit worse. But okay, it's a little bit of a computerish idea, I have to admit. Uh, but anyway, the move rook fd1 was played, and at first glance, it might seem like there's not a big difference between rook fd1 and rook ad1. In some ways, rook fd1 might even look more natural because you're keeping that c file available for the rook because that is an open file, which is where the rooks belong in principle. But it doesn't work tactically, and Fisher just shows how uh, with a plum. So Fisher defends this pawn on d5 with the move of knight to d3 here, which is shutting off the attack from this angle. Uh, and probably White's next move is not the best one, but even if you play some move like knight f4 trying to trade off the knight, Black can still play knight e4, and after takes, I feel like it's probably a bit too risky to take the rook. You know, knight d6 might be an annoying reply. So Black should simply take back, and you, know, you keep this strong knight here. And Black is definitely better, but he's not winning. The game does go on from this point, even though, of course, Black has the, a nice initiative to work with. And in the worst case, can always take later and, you know, mess up the white pawn structure a little bit by doubling the pawns. But instead, we had Queen C2, and admittedly, that is a decisive mistake. But it's a very critical moment of the game, because if Black doesn't find the right, exactly the right move or right continuation here, then it's actually going to be White who is winning with that heavy pressure against this. So in some, to some extent, it's a somewhat understandable mistake by Byrne, who after I think was, uh, I think Donald Byrne was the international master, because you might recall that Fisher actually played the game of the century against Donald Byrne, and he had this win against Grandmaster Robert Byrne later on. So what would be your move if you were black here? Can you find it? Okay, let's see the refutation. So it turns out that Black can launch uh, or detonate an atomic bomb with the move Knight takes F2. And you can't really ignore the Knight, because if you let the Knight come around and take here or take the Rook, it's just completely game over. So King F2 is kind of the only really serious try for White. But then Knight G4, and after King G1, which way would you take back on E3 in this position? Okay, hopefully you saw Knight takes E3 threatening the rook and also threatening the queen. So you might think, okay, the idea, Max, is that you take on d1 and you simply get your material back, right? Actually, no, because if you take, it turns out this position is actually quite decent for white, to the point where it might actually be better, either by, let's say, putting a knight on d4 and just blockading the pawn, or even simply just taking that pawn and saying that these strong two knights are going to be better than the rook and pawn now that white's kind of coordinated. No, Fisher's idea is instead to play the move knight takes g2, getting rid of that key bishop that's defending the king is much more valuable as it turns out. White more or less has to take it, because uh, the knight would always would have been able to come back otherwise. And now there's another key move, and this move could have been played on the previous move, you could have reversed the move order, but it's very important to find this move that Fisher played to get a winning advantage. So what is the key move? Let's see who's up to the task. And actually, I remember the first time I saw this game, I think it was in a book I bought in late 2001, read early 2002, I think it was How Bobby Fischer Wins. I uh, forgot who was the author, whether it was Bruce Pandolfini or Andy Salters, but it was one of these American, famous American authors, I recall. I think it was Pandolfini, now I remember. But if I'm wrong, I guess you guys will correct me in the in the comments. Uh, and actually, speaking of comments, you might also like to see if you found the key move, and you can type it in the comments here as well. Uh, so the only winning move for Black is not to grab the material. You know, this is a game where we see the importance of not just taking the material at the first opportunity. Because now we see, well, white can put the knight on d4, or even play bishop b2, and we sort of see that if white can get a battery, that it's actually the black king that's going to be kind of weak in these positions. So the key move instead is to get this bishop into the attack on the king, which is a very important factor now that the fianchetto bishop around the king after pawn g3 has been traded. So black does that by four, uh, with tempo with the move d4, opening up that long diagonal. And I mean, the white knight can't move away because he needs to defend his buddy on e2 from this attack by the rook and the bishop. So knight takes d4 is kind of the only move. But after bishop b7, white plays the move king to f1. Um, an important question is what if white would have played a move king take to g1 instead? Because that might look like a more natural move at first glance. And actually, this move would be almost surviving for white if it wasn't for a nice combination that Fisher had foreseen. Let's see if you guys can also find it here. Okay, well done if you found the move bishop d4. Obviously, if white doesn't take, he's just completely gone. But now black has a beautiful move. Uh, and I'm pausing for a moment just to give you guys a chance to find it if you didn't see it before. 
So it turns out the move rookie one is a winner because Ivan White takes that rook and leaves that queen on pre. Or if the king moves, black will trade off the queens so that when white takes back, you take the rook and you simply are up in exchange and a pawn. Good enough to win here. So Bone played king f1, trying to avoid that rookie one trick. But now black can win basically by just bringing the queen into the attack. And it turns out there are a couple of ways to do so. Queen c8 or Fisher's move queen d7. And white actually resigned at this point. At first glance, it might seem like it's too early to resign. Because after all, white is up a knight for just one pawn, right? But it turns out his king is so weak on these light squares that white has no good way to defend. For example, let's say we take king g1 anticipating queen h3. Well, I guess you could play rook ad8 and that does allow you to still win the knight this way with the pin, I guess. But let's just take queen a3 just for argument's sake, because obviously they could have played some other move like a knight move maybe to try to avoid like queen a3. But here we can kind of see the problem for white that you know, black is threatening to play bishop takes d4. And then if the queen were to take back running into queen to g2 checkmate. So it makes sense for white to try to move his knight away. A move like knight db5, for example. I uh, don't want to play knight d2 because then queen g2 will be a checkmate when the white queen isn't able to cover it. But now black has actually a few ways to win and the most clinical is just to play bishop to h6. If the queen were to move to some square, like let's say queen f2 for argument's sake, then yeah, bishop e3 and like whether the queen is here or somewhere else, this is obviously going to be a very fast checkmate with queen to g2 in the next moves. So yeah, that was the win by Burn against Fisher. And the reason I showed this game first is because the way in which Salinas Herrera managed to beat Mads Anderson was actually in a very similar way to this game using some very similar tactics. So it goes to show that when you do know these games, the old masters, you can use the same ideas often to even beat seasoned grandmasters today. In other words, the ideas are still very much relevant and can be used to get your IM norms, GM norms, or even for the lower aid players who are watching to beat just your next opponent in a game who is not familiar with the idea or just doesn't see who can play it in that version. So after that kind of long introduction, let's now see how the main game went between Anderson and Salinas Herrera. Obviously, I've included the timestamps that you can easily move around to. If you just want to see the queen sack right away, you can skip ahead if you really, really want to. But I think you'll get the most learning and improvement and the most fun by seeing the game from the very start to see how we got to the queen sack. So let's do that. The game went knight f3, d5. And it's kind of funny, actually, in this game, white actually, for the first moves, is using my recommendation from the uh from the tricky one night f3 repertoire that i recommend against the uh against the slav defense where i recommend this move order basically as a way to a avoid lines like dc4 because white can just take back directly and also to have the option to kind of transpose into a sort of semi-slav in certain cases or even if they go knight d7 like one idea i showed in my course was this idea of going queen c2 and often just going g4, g5 after they castle and just whipping up a strong attack against the king, which is a plan I do think gives white quite legitimate chances to fight for an opening advantage, as well as practically being extremely dangerous. But Salinas Herrera knew of this attacking plan, and so he played bishop d6 with the idea that at some moment he might play a move like e5 if white doesn't play his next move of d4 at some stage. So you have castles, queen c2, and now he transposed to a very standard semi-slav. It is true I have done some videos on the semi-slav in the past so you can always check the uh link in the uh in the suggested video if you want to learn there's something more for black so we have castles bishop e7 and at this point you know the players are playing very fast because it's all very standard theory very strategic position where white's thinking about the right moment to play e4 and get a space advantage in the center and black is thinking about the right moment to play c5 and to match white in the center by us having the two pawns side by side which can lead to some very interesting structures that we're going to see in the game. Rook 81, Rook 88. This is all very main line at this point. And if White were to play some move like E4, just to give you guys a little bit of an understanding of the contours of the position, E4 might look like a very good move at first glance. And it's not like there's anything terribly wrong with the move by any means. But after Queen E4, you do give Black the option to play some move like Knight F6 in the worst case. And then with the move C5 after the Queen moves, Black is going to get his Bishop active. And he is going to be able to trade off the uh, the pawn in theory. But actually a more precise way to play technically would be instead to not play knight f6, but to play bishop b4. And there's a sort of professional line, and by pressure I mean a line that can end in a draw by repetition. Because the best move for black objectively is probably to play bishop to d6. 
And so I've stated why, well, you don't really have a better move than Rook Fe1. And that can lead to a possible draw by repetition, since this is from the World Cup, which are sets of two games. It means that drawing with black is a little bit of an advantage, because it means you can kind of press in the white game. Obviously, having the first move is a little bit of an advantage in chess in general, and certainly at the Grandmaster level also. Uh, white plays a more restrained bishop f1, you know, maybe with ideas to try to fee and carry the other bishop, and go for a more flexible kind of approach. And really, there are a lot of different plans that black can go for here. Like, even a waiting move like h6 is not really so terrible, because it's not like white's really committed to his setup either yet. But it is true, e4 might come in a slightly better version now than with four bishop f1 and h6. So black decides to play more directly with c5, and transition to a different structure where white's not going to get an e4, and after cd5 and ed5, this could actually lead to a hanging pawn structure if white were to play d takes c5, which is a suggestion of the computer, by the way, to go for this structure, and then to play knight e2 and try to bring the knight around f5, maybe in the hope of provoking some weakening like g6 to cover that square. I think that the position would still be about equal. You know, one idea can even just be to play queen f8 and just anticipate the, uh, the attack. Uh, moving the bishop back would be the other way to anticipate knight g3 to f5. But in general, I think that black should be quite fine. You know, sometimes in this position you could put the knight on e4 and just have an active position. Sometimes in the middle game, maybe not in this particular configuration, but sometimes you have the idea of pushing the a-pawn as well to loosen up the structure. Otherwise, what black's dream is is to get in a move like d4 and activate the bishop, but if white's smart, he's not going to allow that in a good version, because that is what black's sort of dream come true would be to liberate all his pieces with such a pawn break. Well, white plays a move g3 instead, and well, he's deciding not to play takes yet, because that might open up that d4 idea, attacking a knight that I mentioned before. Black plays rook c8, I think a very sensible move to put the rook opposite the queen at this point, because you never know when you'll be able to open it up like c takes d4. So now after bishop a3, we come to a very interesting strategic moment of the game. I think that if black doesn't find exactly the right move here, he is going to be facing... Some slightly annoying positional pressure where white can play moves like dc5 have this annoying pin and you know set some little problems. Uh, so what would be your move here if you were playing black in this case? Can you play like Salinas Herrera and start to set up the brilliancy? Okay, so the move that was played here, I guess you have a small hint because you saw a similar structure in the Fisher game just before. But well done if you played a move c takes d4. That's not an easy move to find because you are voluntarily isolating your pawn on d5. But the idea is that, well, for one thing, the queen is kind of misplaced on c2. And with the move knight bishop to b4, well, we're kind of able to pin that knight. Also get out of knight f5 to fork queen and bishop and win the bishop pair. If you want to play knight e4, I will point out that's also a playable move. But I think bishop b4 is the most precise. And at this stage, this is where white started to kind of go astray. The position is still equal if he plays correctly, but Ezo didn't and basically lost in. You're not going to believe this, but actually he gets checkmated in just uh, nine more moves from this point. So how did it happen? Well, for one thing, White didn't play the correct move f3. I think it's quite an important move to not allow a knight e4. It does weaken the e3 pawn a little bit. With the rook defending it quite well, I don't really see that as being a problem. Okay, Black and always play moves like g6, a6, and he can try to you know, grab some squares on the light squares, maybe create some weaknesses. Definitely the pressure down the C file and the weakness that E pawn does fully compensate for the supposed weakness of D5 and the D4 outpost. It's equal, but maybe a bit easier to play black if I was pressed to say. Uh, so in any case, instead of the move F3, which was played in an email game previously, well, I played the new move of knight D2. Um, this was not a prepared novelty though, because it turns out this is actually a decisive mistake at this point. And the reason is actually a little bit different to what Black played, where Black played the move knight e4, which is a very principled move to, you know, have the pressure against the knight. It makes sense of on a strategic level, but a much better move order was to play the move knight to e5. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, well, Max, aren't you just blundering the exchange with bishop c8? Ah, but we've got some grandmaster tricks. Knight to f3. Um, so if they go king f1, well, actually, sort of wherever their king goes, they're in trouble, but say king f1. We just played a move rook c8, and it turns out you're getting that p exchange back anyway whenever you want to, but you've also got ideas like knight e4, piling up the pressure on the knight. You even have ideas like queen e6 and trying to checkmate them with queen h3. Okay, probably queen e7 is a better way to do it, so knight f4 is not coming with a tempo uh, on the queen. But yeah, we can kind of see it a, a bit like we saw in the burn game. 
that white is just way too weak on these light squares and black just getting the material back with a ferocious, decisive initiative. And if the bishop were to retreat here, just knight e4, and there's just not really a good way to deal with that pressure, where black's just going to kind of take and just sort of capitalize on this uh, on the c file using the pin. Uh, so, okay, what's the difference with knight e4 then, you're probably wondering. Well, knight e4 would still be winning if it wasn't for a really great resource that white has here, a very nice tactic. It's why I say triple queen sack, because actually this is another queen sack, but it's time from white's point of view. It turns out that move queen e4 is actually the only move to say in the game, believe it or not. The point being that after d takes e4, white plays rook takes a d7. So he already has two knights for the queen, but he's also threatening the queen and the bishop. We can see the bishop's defending from afar. And after queen f6, rook takes b7. Uh, we have bishop takes c3, hitting the rook and the bishop. So bishop takes c3, rook takes c3. And remarkably in this position after queen takes c3 and now rook d1, even though black is up a full queen for a rook and a bishop, it turns out the rook and bishop actually give full compensation for white. The reason being that when you get those blind pigs on a 7 franc, they're just going to devour the pawns. It's going to force that rook into a passive position. White can also then bring his bishop around to kind of pile up the pressure. So it turns out white's actually got enough of an initiative and enough control of those light squares that actually white is completely fine at this point with the engine giving a 0, 0, 0 assessment here. Though I think I would say it almost feels easier to play white at this point. Maybe I'm being optimistic, but I feel like I would prefer to be white if I had this in the game, because I'm a bit impartial to having the piece against the queen when it's good. But instead, uh, unfortunately, white did not see this resource, or if he did see the resource, he didn't play it. He played the move a3 instead. And well, he thought, okay, if I can break these pins, then my position is going to be okay, and I can focus on attacking this pawn. What he didn't contend with, though, is the move that Salinas Herrera played, and this is not... I was going to say it's not an easy move to find. After seeing the burn game, you probably, you know, think, oh, yeah, this is what Fisher played, so I'm going to play like Fisher, but okay, try to figure, calculate and figure out why at least this move is working, if you are sure it's the move. Okay, so the answer is that knight takes f2 is the key move, very much in the same spirit of knight takes f2 from the burn Fisher game. White plays the move a takes b4 because if white plays king takes f2 and takes the piece, there's queen e3 and, well, king g2 is running into a d4 discovered check, so that's not really in white's best interest. But after king f1, there's queen f3 and actually white gets mated here after bishop to c5. Knight to d4, bishop takes, and I mean, if white plays rook takes d4, you've got rook takes e1 and, and checkmate on the next move taking on... Uh, on f1 as it were. So given that white can't really take the uh, take the knight, well he's basically lost. And the game went a takes b4, knight takes h3, king to f1, because uh, king g2 is running in a d4 and black in the worst case is getting the material back but probably is almost just mating in reality. So king f1 and, and at this point I mean if white had resigned we might have said yeah white just fell for a tactic and that was that. But it's kind of the finish that makes this really special. Because after queen f5, still black has to be a little bit precise because there are two knights under attack and if white can take one of them, he will be a piece ahead. But black just continues to play very well. Uh, he plays the move knight f6, a very nice move. There are moves like d4 and knight e5 that are also winning with kind of similar ideas. Uh, if white were to play queen takes h3, black can just go queen to f3 check. And after king to g1, black has the move knight g4 here. And it's just very hard to deal with the threat of queen e3 and this d4 bring the bishop in the attack. Again, like in the burn game, we can see just how weak white is on the light squares here. Because if you play a move like, let's say, rook f1, for example, black just goes queen to e3. If you don't play rook e1, there's going to be some queen f2 and d4 that's going to be a pain. But we see here d4 comes anyway and white is just losing everything along this long diagonal. So that explains why white played the move bishop to c1 instead. And yeah, I mean, at this point... You could play a normal move like queen e6, be two pawns ahead and just win the end game as such. But instead, black plays absolute brilliancy, the move knight g4. So this is the first queen sack, well, by black. We even saw a queen sack by white before, but the first queen sack by black, realizing that white can't take the queen because knight takes e3 would be checkmate here. <clears throat> and you can't take the knight because then there's queen to f2 checkmate, uh, supported by this knight here. 
So white plays move rook d3, attacking the queen again. And black says, you know what? I don't have to move that queen. My queen is immortal. And he plays a move d4, threatening the move knight takes h2 checkmate. So if white takes the queen, we see that now the bishop is covering g2. So therefore it's a forced checkmate. So white could resign, but he decides to play rook e d1, just saying, okay, I'm going to be sporting and let you win the game in style. Do you guys see the checkmate in two that Black has from this position? Well, I gave a little pause there, so you had a chance to figure it out. It turns out queen g1 is the third queen sacrifice uh, that Black played. And White actually allowed the mate to happen on the board. He played knight g1. And now we see the idea of, of queen to g1. That now the knight is out of the way. The king is in check from the knight. The rook is covering the squares on the e-file. This knight covers this square. This bishop covers this square. So an absolute harmony that all the pieces covering exactly the right squares. Uh, if you removed any one of these pieces, it wouldn't be a mate. So there you have it. That was the really beautiful triple queen sack that I want to show you. Now, if you enjoyed this game, do make sure to smash that like button. Certainly you can subscribe for more of my Grandmaster Chess videos, which won't just make you a better chess player, but going to make you enjoy chess even more as well. So yeah, with that being said, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on this game as well about what your impression was and also if you want me to do more videos like this I always want you guys to let me know as well because well with youtube like i do these videos because i enjoy them but obviously there are a lot of other things i enjoy as well so yeah let me know your thoughts and i'm going to see you guys in the next star uh, chess video get out of here